you, Wanda. Thank you, Wilson and Nancy. Appreciate all that contributed to the service today. You know, I wasn't familiar with that song, but Speak, O Lord is a great song if you look at the words for that. So important to have our hearts prepared for God to speak. And that takes us to our message today as we will consider once again the subject of resurgence. Really last week was kind of an introduction, resurgence, the message. This week, resurgence, the groundwork. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. As we think of resurgence being a fresh encounter with the presence of Christ, we're hoping that the series of meetings, and even in our time leading up to these meetings, will be a season of God's, that His nearness will actually overshadow all of our earthly considerations. And I know that's a lot. But can you imagine just taking time apart to allow the nearness of God to overshadow earthly considerations and our awareness of God be so overwhelmingly real that nothing else will matter to us? That's the goal leading up to resurgence, that during those five meetings that we'll be so there, so thirsting and desiring the presence of Christ. And between now and then, we want the groundwork to be taken care of, the groundwork of our hearts. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's easy to really not have a prepared heart. Especially when um, the enemy really, really wants to attack in this particular area. Mark chapter 4, if you'd stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Beginning in verse 1. And he, speaking of Jesus, began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship, and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, hearken, or we could say listen, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground. And it did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of being able to hear it preached and taught and to have our own copies of it. Lord, thank you that we can meet without fear of persecution today. And Lord, we know there are many that face persecution when they take a stand for you, when they uh, let it be known that they're Christians, and we hold them up to you today and ask that you help them. We ask, God, that you meet with us today and help us to apply your truths to our lives. Help our, the ground of our hearts to be prepared for your voice and for your work. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It says here in Mark 4, if you look down to verse 13, it says, And he said to them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? 
Of course, a parable, as it says in your outline, if you're following along, is stories about everyday situations used to teach spiritual truths. Stories about everyday situations used to teach spiritual truths. About one-third of Christ's teaching was by parables. Parables were taught really to reveal truth to believers while hiding it from those who refuse to believe. Beginning in verse 14, Jesus explains the parable that we just read as you were standing. Let's go through that for just a few moments here, starting in verse 14. The sower soweth the word. And these are they that fell by the wayside, the first ground, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, you may want to circle that, they heard it. Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word which was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which were sown on stony ground, second type of ground, who when they had, there it is again, heard, circle that, they heard the word, immediately they received it with gladness and have no root though in themselves and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Verse 18, And these are they which are sown among thorns, the third type of ground, such as, there's the word again, hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, fourth type of ground, such as, there it is again, hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. You know, in all cases here, all four cases, the word is sown, people hear the word, but only one of the four types of ground received a word. The sower here would be Jesus himself, or really, for this day and time, all who would share the word of God. The seed, the word of God itself. And one thing about the seed, the seed is always the same. The word of God does not change. Okay? The Word of God does not change. The soil being the heart. That's a variable. Because sometimes the ground that the Word falls on is not a prepared ground. It's not a fertile ground. You know, I don't know a whole lot myself about gardening. But I know enough that to have a good garden, it takes more than just to walk out and throw down some seed any old where. It takes quite a bit of work to prepare the garden, the soil. The heart preparation is the first step in preparing for resurgence. When we talk about spirit, the spirit of God is really the driving force in resurgence. There are some things that we can do on our end. We can give you magnets and ask you to pray. We can post sermons and preach sermons that would help prepare us more for the special five days of meetings. We can talk about resurgence. But you know something? Resurgence is a sovereign act of God. He's in control of that. There are only things we can do to show forth evidence that we want what only God can do. You know, the response here in our text does not depend on the sower 
or on the seed. Because the seed never changes. It's the Word of God. And there have even been people that were sowers that really didn't even come to find out know the Lord, but they used God's Word and God took it and blessed it. But really and truly, it's the soil. The soil, what's important, the soil of the heart of the hearer. Notice the various soils as they represent various hearts. There are four types there of soil. There's a soil by the wayside. This would be our unresponsive people. Verse 15. Sowed by the wayside. The wayside here being a footpath or a bordered field. A border around a field. And we see here, according to verse 15, that Satan interferes with the message. Satan interferes with the message. And people are unresponsive. You know, we have a very real enemy, and we're going to be talking more about that later. But I've seen and witnessed in my own life numerous times, whenever there's going to be a youth camp or a VBS or a rev revival services or God's doing something good in the lives of people, in the lives of a church, things start happening. The enemy attacks. I pray for God's protection. I pray for, that he gives us wisdom in identifying and responding to spiritual warfare. It's been said, and it's words to a song, uh, we're walking into the enemy's camp. Are we walking into the enemy's camp laying our weapons down? Because many times that's exactly what we do as Christians. And we let the enemy just smack us around. Some set fell by the wayside, unresponsive people. Second ground, stony ground or rocky ground. These would be your impulsive people. And we've seen those type of people. Uh, they're hasty, enthusiastic, but they make some type of shallow profession or acceptance that really didn't, doesn't turn out to be genuine. Last only for a short time because the word hadn't really taken root in their lives. When hardships or persecutions come on account of the word, they quickly fall away. I think of young people today. And I think of the pressure that they're put up against if they take a stand for Christ. And it's not just young people today. It's believers all over. You take a stand for Christ, people are going to label you. And people are going to struggle with you automatically. But some, those that impulsively respond to the Word, and the Word has no real root in their lives, will fall away. Third is those sown among thorns. These are your preoccupied people. Preoccupation today can strangle the church. Notice the cares of this world and the riches of this life. Things choke the word and it, the word becomes unfruitful. Notice there in verse 19. We say in verse 18, they hear the word, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in choke the word. Wow. You know what? The devil knows what's going to appeal to you. And it could be something different for each and every one of us in here. At first, it can come across as something that really, in and of itself, there's not anything wrong with. Until it takes the place of God in your life. Then we see the good ground. These would be your fruitful people. 
these hearers' hearts are properly prepared to receive the word. They hear the word just like the others. They receive the word and then it says they bring forth fruit. And not all believers are going to be equally fruitful, but all believers are going to be fruitful. Did you get that? Not all believers are going to be equally fruitful, but all believers are going to be fruitful. Fruit is produced sometimes slowly, but always surely. The primary text here seems to be speaking about people hearing the word as far as salvation and being converted to the faith. But you know, I really believe in my heart that all these different soils or ground apply to us even after we're saved and how, in relation to how we receive the word. You see, the word can be snatched from our hearts and we can become unresponsive to it, even as Christians. We can be impulsive, we can get excited but if there's no root, no foundation to that excitement in true turning to God and, and making some changes, unless there's, there's root, it's impulsive. And then the one we probably battle against the most here at Cornerstone Stone is the preoccupation with other things. Preoccupation with other things. Once again, ask you, please, even if you have to rearrange your schedule, even if you have to change some appointments around, make the five resurgence meetings. I've talked to the deacons before and, and I've said, from, for everybody in our church to hear any one particular message, I'd have to preach it about three to five times. Because if you notice, every Sunday, some are here, some are not. And we need to be hearing the same message of resurgence together. In view of what we've covered just now, any given teaching or preaching session we have, there are various types of soil present. Do you know all of those types of heart soil could be present here today? And Satan wants to take away the Word of God, and I want to encourage you not to be used as his tool. Those who are truly saved and truly belong to the Lord, there's going to be some fruit in their lives. One thing I've noticed, do you know when things start getting disruptive in the service more than any other time? Usually invitation. When I try to encourage people to just be obedient to the Lord, that's a very important time. But sometimes... Satan even uses the person in the pew in front of you, the person in the pew behind you, the person in the pew beside you to snatch the word away. And it's our job to make sure that our soil is prepared and willing to receive the word ourselves. You see, the good soil is ready to hear and receive and apply the word of God. The preoccupied soil is so distracted with other things. The impulsive soil is emotionally up and down and gives in to the pressure around it. In the unresponsive, there is no difference made in life. Allowing the word to be taken away. Let me give you seven, try to be brief, seven elements of resurgence that we need to think about based upon having a prepared heart. And again, that's what we're trying to do with the messages and the things that are going to be going on between now and September 20th. First element is preeminence of the Word of God. First place of the Word of God. We're told repeatedly in this book that the Bible is the Word of God. Passages such as 2 Timothy 3.16 that declares all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed. 
2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, it talks about the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, that moved along carries with it the thought of a wind moving a sailboat along. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, When you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. Galatians 1, 11 and 12 says, The gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this preeminence of the Word of God is so important because the Bible is God's Word. The Creator of the universe has communicated to us through His Word. The second thing, though, under the preeminence of the Word of God, it even says itself it's beneficial. It's beneficial today. People say sometimes, well, I don't understand the Bible. I don't get anything out of church. Well, that in and of itself is going against what the Word of God says. Because the Word of God says in 2 Timothy 3.16, not only that it, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, but it says it's profitable. That means it's beneficial. It means it's good for something. You know, the classes that I really did better in in school were the classes that I felt like, we're good for something. In school, did any of you ever take classes that you thought, what on earth am I ever going to do with this? Yep. You know? And some of you probably looking back and, and think, I haven't yet done anything with it, but I had to have it. But my point here is when you approach the Word of God, it's good for something. It's beneficial. It's productive. It says it's good for doctrine. That tells me what to believe. That's what doctrine does. Doctrine tells me what to believe. Reproof, that tells me what's wrong in my life and in the world. Correction tells me how to correct the wrong. Instruction in righteousness tells me how to live. In Psalm 119, 105, God's Word provides guidance. Psalm 119, verse 50, God's Word provides comfort. It gives me what I need. So under the preeminence of God's Word, we have the Bible being the Word of God. We actually have the privilege of having the Word of God ourselves. Then we have something, we have a Word that's beneficial. And then we see the penetrating effectiveness of Scripture. The penetrating effectiveness of Scripture. I like that song that Wanda brought to us, that last song just before I preached about um, listening to the Lord. You know, he says in Isaiah 55, 11, he says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. You know, throughout Scripture, we, we see two things working. We see God's divine enablement, and we see man's responsibility. Is revival, is resurgence a sovereign act of God? Absolutely. Not going to happen if he's not involved in it. But do we carry any responsibility in and of ourselves for anything? Absolutely. And this is something we're, we're trying to do as a church, not just as a few select individuals. Penetrating effect of Scripture, Hebrews 4.12. Would you turn there with me? Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick. That means living. And powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. 
piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You ever come to church and you think to yourself, did, did somebody tell that preacher what I've been up to? Or hear a message that is just point on what you need and what you're struggling with. And sometimes the Word of God just really cuts deep. Notice what else he says here. Not only is it sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing, uh, notice what it says about God in verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In other words, God knows. God knows. Not only is the Word of God penetrating in effectiveness, Scripture says of itself that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How do we have faith to believe? How do we have faith to surrender certain things in our lives? How do we have faith to step out and do what God wants us to do? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Saving faith for the lost and spiritual nourishment for the believer. You see, faith is going to be so important when it comes to embracing the very things that we see in Scripture. And lastly, Scripture is, I'm not lastly, second to lastly there, letter E, Scripture is the believer's weapon. Remember we talked about walking into the enemy's camp, laying our weapons down? This is our weapon. How well do we have it in our hearts, in our minds? How close do we keep it in our lives? You see, Jesus responded to Satan's temptations with the Word of God. And if it was good enough for the Lord Jesus to use, it's certainly going to be good enough for you and I. The last thing I want you to see there... It's an instrument of judgment. We don't always think of it that way. But the Word of God is actually an instrument of judgment. Look with me in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 48, says it pretty clearly. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You know, it was always nice in school when the teacher told us what was going to be on the test. Always done better on those. But you know what? God is telling us what judgment is going to be all about. And the Word of God that we have is going to be our judge. Something to think about. So the first element of resurgence is the preeminence of the Word of God. This particular series of meetings, we're not going to have a whole lot of singing, a whole lot of announcements. It's going to be primarily focused upon opening God's Word and trying to listen to Him. Secondly, second element of resurgence is essential prayer. Essential prayer... You know, prayer is a means of revival or resurgence. And God is the source. And of course, believers is the object. Believers are the object. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, The prayer for revival is ultimately a prayer based upon a concern for the manifestation of the glory of God. I don't know about you and your life, but I don't want to just do church. I don't want to just do that. I'll go as far as to say it's like 
a, a bone out of joint. Something that's just not right. When we're just doing church. And it goes even further than that. We just do God. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I'm supposed to have, my, have the blessing when I eat. I'm not supposed to curse. I'm not supposed to... Uh, and you know, you fill in what else. But we kind of put God in our own little box. And we're going to do God. But according to Martin Lloyd-Jones, prayer for revival is ultimately a prayer based upon a concern for the manifestation of the glory of God which goes beyond you and I. Church is not about what we can get. It's not even about what we can give. It's about the manifestation of God's glory. It's been said there's never been a revival apart from prayer. Passively praying for revival, or resurgence for that matter, is not enough. We must intensely long for and actively pursue it. You know, unless our hearts, the ground of our hearts is prepared, we come into these five meetings and you say, we could th say to ourselves, well, they wanted me to show up, here I am, and we expect something all of a sudden transformative to happen in our lives. Much better chance of something transformative to happen in our lives if our hearts are prepared. If we've been soaking these coming meetings with prayer. It's been said all revival is preceded and sustained by heartfelt prayer. Third, this is a very important one element for a resurgence is a thirst for a fresh encounter with the presence of Christ. You know, when you got saved, you had an encounter with the presence of Christ. And some of you can remember what it was like. Some of you that have had that encounter and been saved a while may have even drifted away from the Lord and come back to Him and kind of had that personal revival in your heart where you got really excited about the things of God. Well, you know what? That can pass if we're not careful. We've talked about drifting, haven't we? How, we? how we go out from our hotel, hotel being about where that clock is, and we say, I'm going to splash around the water, have some good time out here, hope I don't get bit by a shark. And we're out there, and you know, about 20 minutes later, we look, and our hotel's all the way up the coast because we've, what? Drifted, and we didn't know it. We didn't know it. And the same thing can happen as Christians. Because when we lose the thing that's most important, everything else can get messed up. And the thing that's most important, the main focus in resurgence is God. It's the main focus, God. It is His person, His presence, His preeminence. All of that has become central. It is God's immediate presence that we seek. We don't just come seeking a sermon or to listen to music or to be able to get the, the minister off our backs. No, we come seeking an encounter with God. Listen to the psalmist. Psalm 63, verse 1, and first part of verse 2. He says, O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee, my soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory. Then in Psalm 84 verse 2 he says, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. And we touched on this last week, Jeremiah 29, 13. And you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And we know in tech context there, he's talking primarily to the nation of Israel. But we see in James 4, 6 where we can, we can apply that to ourselves. Because James 4, 6 says that um, if I draw near to God, he will draw near to me. 
Evangelist Duncan Campbell defined revival as an awareness of the presence of God. We become too satisfied if we go to church, the environment of the building is comfortable, the people are friendly, the music is decent, and the sermon doesn't put us to sleep. We're comfortable. We are satisfied. And I'm saying we don't need to be satisfied with that. It's not the question, did we enjoy ourselves? The question is, did we experience God? And that could be why many times we leave empty. Empty. It's not that the music's not good. It's not that the lesson might not be challenging. But it's just that our hearts are not prepared. Hearts are not prepared. <coughs> Has there been a point in your life when you weren't going through a tragedy? A point in your life that you were just desperate? for God. We become desperate for Him when we're going through a battle health-wise or a financial battle. But I'm talking about just out of life saying, God, I need You. It's been said there's never been a revival anywhere on earth where there has not been a desperate church. Resurgence is when an individual, a church, a community becomes saturated with God. Hungry for a manifestation of God's glory. And this that I'm sharing this morning may seem just so alien. Because we're so used to it doing it the other way. Also another element of resurgence is prevailing humility. Prevailing humility. <clears throat> Over in James where we read about if we draw near to God, He'll draw near to us. He says quite a bit over in James. And I'm going to turn there if you want to look at it. You can. James chapter 4. I said 4, 6. It was actually 4, 8. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. He says... In verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Prior to that, he says in verse 6, He giveth more grace. Wherefore, He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Humble means to make ourselves low. Fifth, and I'm trying to hurry, recognition. Another element of resurgence is recognition of the Holy Spirit's voice. That's so important. You see, we can grieve the Spirit of God according to Ephesians 4.30. According to 1 Thessalonians 5.19, we can quench the Spirit of God. I personally believe that those two things and the one I'm about to mention in a church service is mostly done at the very end when there's time to respond to God's Word. Acts 7.51 tells us we can resist the Spirit of God. See, there's divine enablement. There's divine power. It's a sovereign act of God. Yes, He's ultimately in control, but He has given you and I the freedom of choice. And with freedom of choice comes responsibility. Sixth element of resurgence is confession of sin accompanied by repentance. It's been said the most intense revivals are those where the people get judgment day honest with God themselves and others. I liked that. That we get judgment day honest with God, ourselves, and others. You see, as we deal with sin, personal sins must be confessed to God, 1 John 1, 9. Private sins should be confessed to those involved. Public sins call for public confession. But there comes a point 
that if we're going to experience a resurgence, there has to be honest confession of sin accompanied by repentance. You see, God never intended the Christian life to remain stagnant. The greatest danger for the church is really staying like we are. You see, what happens in us determines what happens through us. What happens in us determines what happens through us. And lastly, an element of resurgence is resistance, resistance to the enemy. Resistance to the enemy. James 4 verse 7 says, Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. We have a very real enemy. You see, the intensity level of satanic conflict increases dramatically in potential to life-changing events. Make sure you get that. The intensity of satanic conflict increases dramatically in potentially life-changing events. The enemy is on the move. That starts the moment Christians start turning their hearts, their minds, their focus toward the Lord. Let's bow our heads.